International Women's Day 2024. Invest in women. Accelerate progress. A natural inclination and supportive parents saw this woman achieve her highest potential. Why did you choose law as a career? I always say law chose me. Because ever since I've known myself, people have been saying, Rosemary, you should be a lawyer. <laughs> and I, I guess I was a bit of a rebel, but also because I had a very strange perception of law. Maybe it's not so strange. I felt law was only for mercenary people just to make money. And I was sort of sure that that's not what I wanted to do with my life. So I resisted it until many, many years later, when in fact, I had applied to do something else, management. And my then head girl um, came to my convent and she said, Rosemary, you should do law. And I went through and I explained to her that I was interested in social reform and those things. And she said, law will help you do that. And she was right. Did you always want to enter academia? Again, people who thought I should be a lawyer always felt I would be an advocate in the courts because that was, I was always speaking up for the underdog, always making all the arguments. My mother would say, tell Rosemary A, she tells you B, C, D, you know, that kind of child. Um, but again, um, I was sort of titivated by academia, so I thought I might do it for three years or so, two, three years. And I was invited to lecture at Cave Hill. And the next thing you know, um, I stayed, but after that experience, I realized one, it could ful fulfill my own personal objectives, which as I said, social justice, social reform. At the UE, you get opportunity to do a lot of development and policy work. And also because I saw that many of my colleagues were sort of bored with practice, sort of routine practice, you know, mortgages and divorces, which there's all the money there, but which really had no interest for me and no intellectual stimulation. How did it feel being inducted principal of the St. Augustine campus of the UE? Well, I, I felt it was an opportunity to do something good. I thought we needed to shake up a few things and create some change. And many people thought I could do it. So I was pleased to give it a go. What were some of the challenges you have had in your career? You know, I have a strange take on the woman issue. I come from a family of very strong women, um, five sisters in all, each, I guess you could say, leaders in their own right. Even a sister who is a nun was the, the, the chief, the one in charge of the global nun movement. So it seems to be in us. My father was a very liberal man, I realized afterwards. As an adult, I realized how liberal he was and liberated, I should say. He didn't believe that women were inferior to men. And I think that sort of part was passed on to us. I have never felt myself inferior to men. However, that does not mean that I do not see that there are obstacles placed in the path of women. So although I've never really joined women's groups, it sounds a bit odd, people don't realize that. Because I've done a lot of resource work for women's groups and women's issues, but I've never actually sort of seen myself personally as being disadvantaged because I'm a woman, but I see very clearly whether it is in employment, whether it is in leadership and so on, that there are obstacles and perceptions that do make it much more difficult for women, in particular women, to rise to the top. And of course, not just women in leadership, but we do know, and it is very evident in Trinidad and Tobago, that women face a lot more violence in the home and elsewhere. And these are really serious issues which we cannot deny. Are there any successes that stand out for you? Many, many, many. Uh, I think I've been very fortunate, privileged even, to have been working at the UE and as a law academic and being able to participate and lead really so many key projects, consultancies, which resulted in tangible reforms. So whether it is employment, I would have drafted a lot of sort of the path breaking laws. People don't really know this because it tends to be for governments and, and for CARICOM or ILO and so on, but quite a lot of the very important 
legal developments that have taken place. I was the consultant, and I would have been advocating and then had the pleasure of being able to draft legislation and so on, whether it is, um, for instance, the only legislation that I'm aware of still in terms of preventing against HIV in the workplace, I would have drafted. I would have drafted legislation and, and advocated for to protect against redundancy and severance, equal opportunities long before it was popular, uh, many, many um, issues and also in other areas, not just labor law and human rights, in financial law, I've been able to do a lot of projects. Of course, the latest would have been the marijuana one, which did result in tangible law reform. So that gives me pleasure. Perhaps one of the biggest highlights was a big project I led in the TCI, Turks and Caicos, when the UK government revoked the constitution because of alleged corruption. And uh, an EU team, UK team came in and I was um, elected, um, nominated, appointed, I should say, to be the leader of that international team. And we drafted about 48 pieces of legislation and that was responsible, according to the governor, for bringing them back to um, self-rule. So those things, those sort of tangible things, I take pleasure in that it's not just, you know, for intellectual sake, but also that you have been able to do concrete things for social development. How do you think we can invest in women to accelerate their progress? I think obviously there are some concrete things that one can do in terms of education, in terms of leadership, um, some even suggest quotas and so, but quite apart from those things, I also do really believe that women need to be encouraged to be, to be more confident because a lot of the limitations I believe are self-imposed. Women don't put themselves forward often, even when they are the best in the room. And I think there's been a lot of research about that and I do see it with some of my colleagues and peers. You know, men have more confidence, especially when it comes to leadership. Of course, that comes after centuries of <laughs> being there. So I think I remember when um, Hazel Brown was alive, she had a very important movement in terms of women in politics. I was in Barbados at the time, but I used to send my little financial contribution because, yes, I think she was on the right, uh, in the right direction, that we need to actually train and inspire and encourage women, and not just in politics, but in every field up endeavor and when you add that to some of the concrete things that we are now doing uh, in terms of protecting women in terms of ensuring that women have voices in different places I think that would be important but this thing about confidence I believe is really important do you think it important to celebrate International Women's Day annually for International Women's Day once we can make it meaningful and so far, I think we've been doing a pretty good job of it in Trinidad and Tobago. Many NGOs um, have events, like I'm president of family planning. We do, find it, we do have an event around the Savannah with other NGOs. Uh, of course, there's that big concert coming up. There are many things um, that happen for International Women's Day. So I think they've done a good job in making sure it's visible and ensuring that people reflect on these issues. It's not always the same for some of the other days. But International Women's Day, for sure, I think it has been meaningful and hopefully it can continue to be meaningful. Invest in women. Accelerate progress. The Office of the Parliament celebrates International Women's Day 2024.